I, I think that if you ask anybody uh, in this community, in the Magic Valley, what has been the big story of the last six months in this area, you'd probably get uh, an answer related not necessarily to water issues or any, any, any general crime issues, but it would come down to, well, some of the issues we had nationally over the weekend in places like Minnesota, New Jersey, and New York. And there have been, a, I guess, multiple groups. I won't say one. There have been multiple groups of concerned citizens uh, who have been uh, extremely active in all of this. And whether you agree with them or not, you have to appreciate the fact they've been working very hard on this issue over the last several months. Seven minutes after nine o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 56 right now. And we're joined by a guest this morning who's been working with them. His name is Lee Stranahan. They had an event last week, and I was unable to get there, but I got, uh, I got uh, contacted over the weekend. and Somebody asked if I would like to have Lee on the air with us, and I said, sure. I'd like to get his perspective on the on the program. He's uh, working right now on a project called Great Hometown, uh, greathometown.com. But first of all, welcome to our program. Bill, thanks very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Your your interest in this has been somewhat professional, from what I understand, at least in the beginning, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm a. I'm the lead investigative reporter for Breitbart News, and uh, obviously, we've gotten as a company a little bit of press lately because about a month ago, Steve Bannon, who's my friend and and uh, was my boss, has now taken over the Donald Trump campaign as a CEO. He's now running the Trump campaign. And I got to say, anybody who's noticed a change in the Trump campaign in the past month, and in, particularly in the poll numbers, uh, I don't want to toot someone else's horn, but uh, Steve really deserves a lot of credit. I know Steve very, very well. And, uh, and, and Steve, all the good stuff that happened, Donald Trump going to Louisiana, his inroads in the black community, all of this stuff happened after Steve came on. And uh, so that was really part of my thing. I mean, I, again, I know Steve well, and we've talked a lot about not just Trump as a personality, because I think that as a personality, uh, Trump, some people like him, some people don't like him. But there really are a set of ideas behind the Trump campaign. And I think that this anti-establishment populism is a really important one. And the other one for Trump is obviously uh, America first, is make America great again ideas. So... We came. I came up here to look into the Fawnbrook assault. I'd looked into it a little bit on the ground, but I, I go places. And, um, you know, I looked into the wider issues about what was going on, and I found that refugee resettlement has been a controversial issue prior to that assault. That assault happened, you know, where the five-year-old girl was uh, attacked by the refugee boys uh, here in Twin. But the refugee resettlement issue was already controversial. People were already questioning what was going on with that, particularly since, obviously, refugee resettlement has a long history in Idaho and here in Twin Falls. It goes back 30 years or so. But in the past five or six years, it's become vast majority of Muslim uh, refugees coming in. And I think that, as you point out uh, aptly, given everything that went on, not just this weekend, but the rise of Islamist terrorism in the past few years, the notable rise of Islamist terrorism, uh, I think people were questioning that before. Like, why are we bringing uh, so many Muslims into Twin? Idaho has the largest per capita number of refugees of any state in the country. Not the largest number, but, you know, refugees to citizens. Idaho's got the largest number in the country. And I think a lot of people statewide and also here in the Magic Valley are looking at that. I, I, you know, I've been following the issue, obviously, for well over a year myself. And uh, I've, I've talked to the governor. Our, our governor, I think, was the first governor in the country to come out and say, I think we need a, a pause in this program for the time being until we figure out who happens to be who that's coming here. And 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 then you had 18 or 19 governors, I think, nationwide that, that immediately – followed him on that. And I've talked to state legislators. I've talked to people in city and county government about this. And I see what goes on at city council meetings, and uh, it's a little harsh. Um, now, the question I guess I have to ask, because I do have a lot of friends who are down there making the arguments, but what is it that they expect 
city government to do because it almost seems like on the local level, anybody who's been elected to office really has their hands tied on this. Well, I think one thing they didn't expect them to do is to call them racist, which is what happened. Um, I think that there were attacks from the city council, and I, I wrote a story about one of them, Greg Lanting, uh, actually attacked the family of the victim on Facebook and said things that demonstrably were false about that family. Now, Mr. Lanting has subsequently apologized, which I, I gave him credit for at the time, and immediately reported that he had apologized for that. So I do, I do give him, him credit for that. But it's really an unusual situation for the city council to be actively attacking the parents of a rape victim. And since I've been up here in Twin in the past month and a half, there was also another uh, Muslim refugee who molested a mentally retarded woman. Right. And, and then there was another refugee who came back to Twin to try to murder a couple of people that he'd met in the refugee program. He'd been down in Utah, he came back to Twin with a knife and wanted to kill him. And, you know, again, for the number of refugees that are in Twin as a percentage of population, right, uh, that's, that's a, you're getting some fairly high numbers. And so I, I think the number one thing the city council could have done was not attack the people raising issues. But look, We've seen this nationally. This is no, um, there's nothing new about this. And the political correctness that's going on right now, where if you raise a question, you're immediately attacked as a racist, a xenophobe, whatever, right? You're, you know, Islamophobe, whatever. Uh, that sort of thing is happening on a national scale, but it's also happening here in Twin. And that's one of the reasons that as a, a national reporter, I found what was going on in Idaho and in Twin Falls in particular, to be of national interest, because it's kind of a microcosm of the problems that we're seeing across the country. Um, but it's at an earlier stage here. You know, uh, it's, uh, Twin Falls isn't New York or L.A., where you could drop a 1,000 refugees on a, you know, busloads of refugees there this afternoon, and nobody would notice. Does that make sense? Like It does, sure. It, it, so here... If you go out to a, a shopping center, as I've done plenty, you notice the hijabs a little bit more, right? Um, even where I, I live currently, we're moved, my wife and I are moving up to Twin from Dallas. My wife noticed this a few years ago. She, she'd be, she's like, did I not notice women in hijabs and burqas before? Were they always around? Because she said, in the past few years, I'm just seeing this like everywhere. And I think a lot of people have had that experience. But I, I, you know, you're allowed to notice that because, and I'm not even saying, and it's bad, just, and it's interesting. You know, it's interesting what's going on there. Um, and so I think, I think that that's part of it. So we, I have tried to simultaneously hold the city council's feet to the fire, have reasonable expectations for what they can and can't control. But you've got to understand that they're tied. I mean, you, you, I, you understand. I'm not telling you anything you don't know here, Bill. They, the city council is tied to CSI, which is where the major refugee resettlement comes from, which, by the way, is unusual. Um, you don't have refugee resettlement so tightly tied to, uh, you know, effectively a community's college every place where this happens. That's really unusual. Well, if I could interrupt for a moment, let's, of course, just, let's yeah. just say that uh, CSI tomorrow disowned the program. Wouldn't the program just move three blocks off campus and start all over again? It 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 might, but part of it is CSI is also very tightly connected to the business community. For instance, the small business development stuff that happens is all in CSI. That's in the same office as Region 4, which is another big economic part of the economic engine. And so when you look at the the drive for refugees nationally, I see it as part of a globalist movement. In other words, big look, you have Hamdi Yilakai, the head of uh, the CEO of uh, Chobani. Everyone knows the relationship of Chobani to twin. He's one of the leading advocates of refugee resettlement nationwide, and he's closely allied with Bill Clinton, who he appeared with on a half hour speech. Hillary Clinton, who's tweeted about Chobani, 
Chuck Schumer, the Democrat uh, senator from New York, right? So he's got, and, and John Podesta, who's the former Clinton chief of staff, uh, has worked with Yulikaya. So Hamdi Yulikaya is a heavily connected uh, non-American. He's Turkish. He still hasn't gotten his citizenship, which no one's explained to me ever. In fact, when we asked Chobani officially, is he a U.S. citizen, their response was no comment. Now, that's bizarre to me, right? If I ask you, are you a U.S. citizen, the answer might be yes, it might be no, but it's not usually no comment. And um, I think that broadly throughout the country, we're seeing refugees brought in, and there's no doubt it lowers wages, right? It's, it's, it is, in fact, um, uh, lowering wages and, and creating a different employment situation, which is exactly what the goal is. That's what they want to do with it now. It's no longer let's get rid of the refugee crisis by solving the thing that caused it, which was Hillary Clinton's policy in Syria. Let's be very clear on that. I went to Lebanon in 2013. I was talking about ISIS a few months before anybody in the U.S. And it was obvious when you went over there and talked to people that the Clinton-Obama policy was not only getting Christians killed in Syria, and I reported on that at the time, but not only that, it was creating this massive refugee crisis that I documented back in 2013. And I said back in 2013, this is coming to America. It has to. There's too many refugees. So the solution would be stop this stupid policy that's supporting Islamists in Syria. Um, but instead, it's just like, well, you, you deal with it. You just deal with them. Here's the refugees. You deal with them without actually dealing with the root cause of the problem. Our guest is Lee Stranahan. He's joining us this morning. And, of course, that website that's set up for this for people to learn more Greathometown.com, uh, right? Uh, Greathometown, all one word, dot com. People can take a look at that. Can you stick around for a few more minutes? I have a, a hard break coming up. Of course. And uh, uh, that'll be about a, a three-minute break or so, but we'll continue with Lee Stranahan from Breitbart in just a couple of minutes right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And we're talking refugee resettlement. And I, I do point out uh, he has been in this community now for a number of months doing his research on all of this. And I have a question for him coming up in the next segment, just on a recommendation or two he might have about what direction as a community we could go from here. In the meantime, uh, 56 on our way, perhaps into the 70s today, and then some cooler weather ahead for the next couple of days. It's 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. We're talking refugee resettlement with Lee Stranahan who, of course, is with uh, with Breitbart News and uh, also working on the local level with this uh, organization. And, and as we pointed out, there's a website, greathometown.com. You can check out as well. And one of the questions I have, because as I pointed out in the past, you have a lot of people on the local level in government who uh, who do feel their hands are tied and, uh, and will tell you off the record that they're a little concerned or very concerned about what we're seeing in this community when it comes to refugee resettlement. It's only in the last couple of days we've seen a lot of activity going on on Capitol Hill. And, of course, the election of Donald Trump would be what would really bring all of this to an end. But it, it, it also comes back to the, to, the, uh, to the question, what's the recommendation for people politically on the local level? And, uh, and Lee, I guess that's a question you put a lot of thought into. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. You know, uh, there's a great activist community in Twin Falls, and I and – I, and I say that as somebody who's traveled around the country a lot, um, and I'm a Republican, but I've seen a lot of Republicans in a lot of the country. They simply aren't active. So it's one thing to, to stay at home and complain on Twitter and Facebook, and I've done plenty of that myself. But one thing that the left is great at is actually doing stuff, doing petitions, doing uh, protests, doing something going to city council, showing up. So when I came here and I saw that there are people who are actually doing things, I, it was very impressive to me, and I told them that right away. Now, because nobody was born knowing how the political system really functions, you have to learn that through experience. In some cases, they didn't have the experience to know how to chalk up successes, and were, were glad to get some perspective on how to do that. And um, 
you know, I went to the economic development meeting last week, and there was a 6.30 a.m. meeting over at CSI with a number of people from the city council there and a presentation uh, by Mr. Rothwell as the uh, city manager. And I'll tell you, the goals that they have for Twin Falls, the goals are actually good. They're aware that Twin Falls is losing young people, for instance. They're aware that Twin Falls is having trouble attack, attracting young professionals. And that's true. And the problem is, while uh, these big plants, Glambia, Chobani, Cliff, right, Cliff Bar, have brought some economic benefits to Twin Falls, there's also some downsides. And one of them is relatively low-wage factory jobs, although they can be good for the economy um, in some ways. They don't attract people. They, they don't really bring the kind of stuff that the city council clearly wants to bring, but I don't think quite knows how to yet. So what we're trying to do with GreatHometown.com is we realized that the Trump campaign at a national level is a nationalist populist movement. Nationalist, Donald Trump, uh, America first, right? And he's anti-establishment. And a lot of these, the establishment, you know, you talk about who's in favor of, of you know, uh, Im immigration reform that would make citizens out of illegals, or who's in favor of this refugee program. Interestingly, it's McCain and Clinton, or it's John McCain and Clinton. We just saw yesterday, who's George uh, George H.W. Bush going to vote for? Hillary Clinton. And who's been pushing this foreign policy that creates the refugees? It's the establishment Republicans like the Bushes and the Clintons, right? And so uh, that's the establishment that Trump is fighting. We're trying to fight that, too, on a local level. GreatHometown.com, we're saying some of these issues have to be handled locally. So, for instance, we had the head of the refugee program at CSI say in the Times News, say in the paper, after some articles that I had written, he said, well, well companies don't even... I, I, I'd written about all the economic incentives to hire refugees for businesses. And the head of the refugee program said in the paper, well, we don't really need those economic incentives. Well, okay, that's, that's a great point. <laughs> and if you don't need them, let's get rid of them. Let's maybe put some effort into saying, saying why not hire a veteran rather than a refugee? Because veterans, as we all know, do jobs. They've already proven they'll do jobs most Americans won't do. Sure. They'll get up at 5 in the morning, right? And, and, and they'll do the horrible stuff that our veterans are required to do, just, you know, getting up and carrying a heavy pack and, you know, burning, burning latrines in the middle of the, uh, you know, Afghanistan desert. And so that's, a, that's like one of the things we're going to start to put through legislatively here locally. Let's take the resources that are being put into refugees and put it in to the heroes that have already served this country. I'm going to have you hold that thought for a moment. Can you stick around? We may, may as well just take this till 10 o'clock this morning and uh, coming up on a break at 9.30. But if you've got time... Yeah, I sure do. I sure do. And then perhaps we can take some telephone calls too as well in the next half hour. But Lee Stranahan is our guest. He's, of course, with GreatHometown.com and also Breitbart News. It's 9.30. Bill Colley with you as well on KLIX. That's News Radio 1310. KLIX, and you can listen to us online at newsradio1310.com. It's 57, and uh, we'll continue our conversation with Lee in just a few minutes. We're talking refugee resettlement or the direction this community is going and, and perhaps the direction the government is going, maybe on the national level, but perhaps what even government could do on the local level. More details on all of that in just a few minutes. We'll get back to our guest, Lee Stranahan, in just a moment. He's from Breitbart News and, of course, also working with a local group, and uh, you can find out more about what they're doing at greathometown.com. Just a quick reminder, though, I think that this is appointment radio most mornings, but if you're having difficulty hearing us, you need to give a telephone call to Dr. Christine Pickup, a doctor of audiology at Mont Harrison Audiology in Rupert. She reminds you that when you're hearing, it's what's going on between your ears that counts. The brain is where sound becomes the details, and your brain has to work harder to make that happen, if you're struggling, when the sound signals from your ears are compromised, the brain is working harder to fill in the gaps, and that extra effort does take a toll. Don't let your brain down. Take care of your hearing with the help of Mount Harrison Audiology. Call the office at 208-312-0957 or go online 
MontHarrisonAudiology.com. 934, it's 54. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story. On News Radio 1310 KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. That, as I mentioned, uh, Lee Stranahan is going to be joining us uh, for the rest of the hour, or staying with us for the rest of the hour. Question for you on what you were just talking about with uh, plans for you know, having a, a more self-sustaining hometown economic development. I would think that a lot of people on the political class would agree with that, but it seems to me a lot of bridges have been burned over the last few months, maybe on both sides, and difficult to see how everyone can get back on the same page and work together. Is there a an idea you've got that would maybe make that a little bit easier? Well, you know, I went to the I went to the city council meeting this past Monday and spoke briefly, and um, in the public comment section, and I specifically, for instance, made sure to be non. I was, I, I'm not afraid to be confrontational, um, but I I made a point to say that I'd been to the economic council meeting. I agree with the goals, and I said, for instance, you know, they've been talking about urban development here in Twin for for years now, as far as I understand, right? And they're still talking about it. And I think that's a good idea, but let's talk about how to achieve it, right? It just a simple thing, and I brought this up. I said, you need, if you're going to revitalize downtown, you need some anchor businesses down there that make people want to go downtown. In other words, it, the downtown could have the nicest sidewalks in the world, but unless you have a reason to go, it could have the greatest city hall in the world. But that's not, you're not going to pack up the, the wife and kids and say, honey, let's go down to City Hall. Um, so you need to have some kind of anchor businesses. And you only have two minutes to talk at, at the city council meeting. So I, I didn't get into a couple of ideas I have there. But I was trying to bring up positive ideas that I think 80% of the people would just go, yep, yeah, I agree with that. That makes I mean, it's just common sense, right? And try to help fill some of the holes uh, that the that the city council and the city manager have, where like I say, some of the goals that they have, I think, are very good. But but I, I, and I, look, I believe they would be the first to admit they're open to good ideas, no matter where they come from. So, you know, I I said this to people in city government. I said I want you to think of our group, GreatHometown.com, as loyal opposition. Right? We really have the same goal. I think I think. Let's assume that everybody here means it when they say the city council, the city manager, everybody, that they want to make Twin Falls a better place to live for everybody. And we're going to hold their feet to the fire on some issues where uh, we, we don't agree with them, but we're going to work with them. We're a small government group. We believe in smaller government. We're not trying to get um, a government grant to do what we're doing. We, we take a private approach to it. And so we're not, we're not going to the city council uh, ever, hat in hand, give us money to do this thing. Um, but we, but ideas are free, right? And saying stuff like, let's think about what kind of anchor businesses. I mean, a specific, I'll spend 15 seconds on this I could because I could talk about it for 10 minutes. But what if, for instance, you had the kind of thing that they have in Seattle, Pike's Place, a public market downtown, where there were stands where you could buy fresh produce, you know, fresh, you know, uh, you know, custom sausage or something like that, uh, and you know, cut flowers and local craftspeople, right? Where you could rent a stall for a couple hundred bucks a month, so local small small business people could afford to have a stall there. And now you'd have an interesting place that people might want to go to. Now, again, that's the kind of idea that I think people. You know, again, maybe that's a bad idea. I don't know. It's, it's Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a dumb idea. And maybe someone will say, that's a dumb idea, but it sparked my thinking, here's a better idea, right? And that's what the goal is, really. So, uh, so some of this has been to try to, um, I, I don't want to say mend fences, because I think, I, I think the city council has been out of line in some areas. And as I say, Greg Lanting's already apologized for something that he did. But... Um, uh, I, I think that there's a way to work together without actually trying to get money. That's, you know, a lot of people, this is the problem. The establishment, Republicans figured out there's a lot of money in government. And uh, th so they'll preach free market economics on one hand, but really they're, they've figured out how to make huge amounts of money through the government. And that's the thing I need to, that needs to stop both 
nationally and and locally. Well, I, 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 I believe in freedom. I believe in less government. And so well, hold that thought for a moment. You betcha. We've got more coming up, and uh, in the last uh, the last quarter of the hour, what we'll do is we'll also try to take some of your telephone calls as well. Lee Stranahan joining us from Breitbart News this morning, and uh, he's talking more expansively just beyond uh, refugee resettlement and some of the uh, ills that come along with that, but perhaps how uh, we can take a different approach in this community, and we might not necessarily need to be importing people from overseas if we had a good local labor labor force that didn't pack up and move away when it got out of school. Details ahead. We'll get back to our guest in just a moment. Lee Stranahan is with Breitbart News, and he's also now locally with Great Hometown. And you can find more details on that on, on online on the web by going to greathometown.com. Uh, I do want to mention we are looking toward a couple of colder days coming up ahead with temperatures, high temperatures only in the 50s the remainder of the week. And uh, that cold winter weather coming in early means you have to test that furnace. If that furnace showing signs that it might need some, what you might call some maintenance, you got to give the pros a call at Ramsey Heating and Electric. The team at Ramsey's will come out. They'll make sure the job is done right. They'll make sure it's done right the first time. Problem-free, cozy winners found at Ramsey Heating and Electric. 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. The telephone number, 678-0459. Ramsey Heating and Electric, where they sell warm winters and cool summers. 944. And uh, Lee, we've had some folks who've been trying to get in touch with us throughout the hour. You don't mind taking a few calls now, do you? Of course not. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll go to the telephones. Caller, you're on the air with Lee Stranahan on KLIX. What's on your mind? Uh, yes, I wanted to know why uh, all these refugees are Muslim. Seeing that there's a Holocaust going on uh, for Jews and Christians in, in, uh, in Syria and I- Iraq, uh, why don't we prioritize rescuing this, that, that population? That's a, that's a good question, Lee. The fact of the matter is that only a handful of these refugees have been Christian that have been admitted to this country in the last couple of years. Well, that's exactly right. In fact, a recent news report said that less than 1% of the Syrian refugees that have come into the country uh, are, are, are Christian. And this is one of the things I've been asking for a while, and you never hear about it in the media. It is well known at this point that Muslim countries, particularly that are in that region, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, they have taken in basically no refugees. When the crisis started in Syria, uh, Beirut took a huge number. So did Turkey. So did Jordan. But these other Muslim countries took none of them. And just culturally, even if I'm looking at it from the perspective of the Muslims, I would think that a, a, a Muslim would be more comfortable in a country that shares the Arabic language, that shares the Muslim culture. But, but why didn't Saudi Arabia take in refugees? Why didn't they do it? Well, their answer is they were afraid of terrorism. So I guess they're racist too, right? This is, this is what bothers me with the political correctness of anybody who brings up the issue and goes, well, what about terrorism? They're immediately branded as a racist, right? Well, uh, I guess the the Muslim Saudi Arabian country, the home of Mecca, I guess I guess they're racist against Muslims too. So, here's a question, and it, you know, I have talked to a great many people. I mean, you know, Democrats and Republicans in this community, and uh, officially, if you ask them, they, yeah, I mean, I sat in here during campaign season last year and watched people squirm when the question came up because they were worried about answering it and maybe offending one group or another. But off off the record, they will tell you that they're highly concerned about all of this. What what does it take to um, to perhaps bring them out? What how do how do if they have that concern? Um, because you know Donald Trump doesn't have any qualms about this. He says what's on his mind and he lets the chips fall where they may. Uh, how do we how do we bring those politicians who are behind the scenes opposed to coming out and 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 publicly saying you know this is a problem. Well, it's tricky because let's first off, you have to deal with the forces, even in a town like Twin, and that's one of the reasons I I like. I mean, I like I love the people here. It's a beautiful country. That's why we're moving here. Um, but you need to d- get people to deal with the forces, and they say people don't like to talk about religion and politics. So let's let's talk about them. For instance, among the people who are very pro refugee program 
have been the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, and the LDS, the Mormon Church. And they're all, all those churches are directly involved with the refugee program. Now, of course, a, the, the believers in a church, I'm not interested in debating doctrine or anything like that with anybody. People obviously have a right, there's a variety of religious views. I'm talking about the churches as institutions, as big institutions, right? So if your church has come out and said, we're pro-refugee, that creates a certain amount of pressure. If you're a parishioner of that church, if you're part of that stake, if you're, if you're involved in that, there's a pressure to you. You should go along with what the church is saying. And I think that that's created a, a pressure. But again, people, as soon as you start to bring, oh, you're anti-Mormon, you're anti-Catholic, whatever. And I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not anti any of those things. It's a side discussion to me. But it's one of those things that I think has made the discussion more difficult. Here's another thing. The economic incentive. When you have Hamdi Yulikaya, CEO of Chobani, as one of the country's leading advocates for refugees, he's brought other companies together to advocate for the refugee program, connections to the Clintons, and so on. It becomes a little difficult when you're in Twin Falls to speak up on that guy's major issue. I don't know how else to put it. If you're, if you're in a town where one of the leading economic influencers is, you know, if he loves Ford Mustangs and you're more of a Chevy Camaro guy, you're, you're going to probably be quiet, just to use a, a weird analogy, but it's, it's simple human nature. And so I think that those are some of the factors that are affecting some of the politicians. They simply, and I get it, I, I get it, none of this is demonizing anybody, but the thing about Trump and, and is because he was already rich and already famous. He can say stuff and whatever. He's outside the system. So I try to do that, too, to some extent. You know, I'm, I'm not a racist. I sleep very well at night. I'm not a racist. Uh, I'm not a bigot. And like I say, I went to Beirut to cover this crisis in 2013. So that stuff is just water off a duck's back when it comes to me. Um, I don't... I, I don't worry about, about being labeled as such, but I'm not, a, I'm not a politician. But I think, you know, that's part of what we're trying to encourage here is just open dialogue, and that's why I appreciate you so much, Bill, for, the, for you, you, and, you know, you, you, you're not afraid to speak out on these issues, and uh, you're not afraid to have me on as a guest. And I think that that's what's required. I think what's required is a little balance. We have a media that is so biased. Let's just get a little balance in that. You, you posted a great story on Twitter today from the New York Times talking about how everybody realized the culture has moved so far left, mm -hmm. so far left right now, that people are afraid to say anything, and that's what I'm fighting against. When, 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 I don't know how you can you can go to these people and say perhaps we will back you up if you know if if you need to take a, tr a stronger stand because see they're worried that someone might get offended and pull his business out of town, and then they get blamed for a loss of jobs. I, I know how that works. So they feel caught between a rock and a hard place. I don't know how you can better support them in that situation. Well, I think, first off, um, you can raise the issues in a way that are um, productive. I, I don't know how else to put it. You can try to raise the issues in a way where you're going to get some wins. You're not just going to get rack up a noble loss, if that makes sense. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, at a certain point, beating your head against the wall isn't fun. And if you're beating your head against the wall, it's hard to say to other people, hey, come join me as I beat my head against the wall. If you're getting wins, if you're getting victories, um, and if you have a solution that's, that's common sense and that cuts across all these issues, you can win. Uh, just a simple example. When the head of the refugee program in town says that businesses don't really need the incentives, and he said that in the Times News article recently, when the head of the refugee program says that, I'm inclined to agree with him. Okay, you don't need the economic incentives. I read that in the paper. So there you go. Case closed, right? Now let's start to put some of those resources to the heroes that are in southern Idaho, the heroes that are in the Magic Valley, the men and women who serve in the military, the vets, let's give them some resources. Let's start a hire the vet campaign. Let's, let's 
not spend a dime more, but let's shift the resources from the refugees to the veterans. Now, you think, you think if you propose that issue, who's going to come out against that? You see what I'm saying? Because they're already on the record saying they don't need the money. Okay, great. You don't need the money. I, I, I think some veterans will. And I think there's a very clear case for hiring veterans, which is these are men and women who have already proven they'll do jobs that, quote, unquote, Americans won't do. And if that's where we push the issue, that kind of thing, I think we can really rack up some victories here. And, and God bless them, the, the activists who are here in Twin Falls and, you know, from the area have been – uh, part, part, part of the, these aren't my ideas. I got to point that out. These are ideas that have come up through discussion with people who are veterans, let's say locally, and are saying, "Look, here's what the problem is." And our the way we approach things at at GreatHometown.com is to listen, and it should come bottom up, not top down. Inner city people in Detroit have problems too, and their solution isn't the same as Twin. But the solution broadly is exactly the same, which is stop the Democrat and Republican establishment who don't want to solve problems, they just want to perpetuate them. Lee Stranahan is our guest this morning on uh, Top Story, 954. Bill Colley with you as well. It's 59, and you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. There has been, of course, you know, some criticism that some of the, you mentioned that, that, that some of the comments made by members of the council have been harsh when it comes to allegations of racism and the like. but in turn, and this is where I've I've had a little bit of a break with some of this, is that I think some of the some of the folks on the other side, they're not you know they're not public relations professionals. I recognize that, but it, it seems to me that perhaps you get more flies with honey than with a fly swatter. Yeah, I think I think in some cases that's true. I think it's not a bad idea to have both, um, and and uh, I think that the you know the people I've you know. Again, part of the reason that I'm moving my family up here, aside from the fact that for us personally, uh, like we homeschool, for instance, Idaho's got great homeschool laws. So there's a lot of things that make sense. It's a beautiful country, and and uh, I like the pace of life here. But aside from that is when I've gone out and broken bread with these people, when I've gone out and broken bread with the activist community, when I've hung out with them extensively, they're really, they're really good people and who have... Uh, great goals that actually the thing I began to see is their long-term goals are closer to the city council's goals than anybody right now can see, I think. Uh, although I, I, I don't want to really say that because when I went out with a couple, couple of other activist friends of mine to this Economic Development Council meeting, they were like, you know, that all sounds reasonable. Yeah, we're in favor of that. Now, again, I think part of the difference is how you achieve those goals. They want to do it they're the government, so they, they're the government, right? That's what they do. We're trying to do it more privately. Um, but I do think that, uh, that they've gotten a bad rap. And i got to say, too, when you, w- there's a power imbalance. When you have Wendy Olson, the U.S. attorney for, for Idaho, come out and talk about the Fawnbrook case and say stuff that can reasonably be interpreted as a suppression of their First Amendment rights, like, don't spread rumors or you'll go to jail or something. I, mean, I forget what she said, but she had to apologize for it. There's a power imbalance, right? Citizens don't have that power. So when the U.S. attorney, Wendy Olson, comes out and says something like that, you know, I'm, uh, I support the little guy, you know, and uh, I think that that's the kind of thing where I don't think there's any fair comparison between the activities of local activists who are citizens and the most powerful people, the city council in the, in the city, and one of the most powerful people connected to the state, Wendy Olson. So that's, that's why, to me, I'm like, I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but I do think that the, the local activists have really gotten a bad rap to some extent. Well, i got to thank you for your time today. And quickly, the website again, uh, for people who'd like to get involved, what would that be? It's a greathometown.com. Our slogan is "Make your hometown great again." And if you want to type in that whole thing, "Make your hometown great again.com," you'll get to the same place. But isn't greathometown.com shorter? Yes, I think it is. <laughs> Brevity. <laughs> uh, hey, I thank you for your time this morning. Uh, likely we'll be talking again. I'm sure at some point. 
I sure appreciate it, Bill, and I, pre- I appreciate you uh, you taking the time and all the work you do here. Thanks very much. All right. Good luck, sir. Lee Stranahan joining us this morning. Uh, of course, mentioning he's moving his family to Twin Falls. Uh, he is, of course, a reporter for Breitbart News as well. 958. God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow me to come back and do this all over again tomorrow morning. I do want to point out, Robin Brody is scheduled to join us tomorrow. She is a candidate for state Supreme Court. We had a chance to talk to her at the fair a couple of weeks ago. She's going to be joining us for a lengthier period tomorrow morning to talk about her campaign. In the meantime, Rush Limbaugh will follow the news at 10 o'clock from Fox. Also coming up following the news at 1 o'clock this afternoon, it's Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck between 4 and 7 o'clock this afternoon, and then Dave Ramsey tonight. All of that ahead on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com.